The one and only. He is NC Central's head basketball coach. He is a Raleigh legend and is a future governor of the state of North Carolina, in my opinion. Lavelle Moten joins us on the Adam Gold Show. All right, so uh, uh, when when I saw the news that uh, the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, I've heard she's running for office. Uh, she says, "I I want to I want to meet NC Central's basketball coach. I want to meet Lavelle Moten." First right. of all, the, when you hear that, <laughs> well, how does that make you? You have reached a certain level. Maybe she. Maybe I'm onto something. Maybe you are the future governor. Oh man, I don't know about my future in politics, man. <laughs> like you got to be perfect out there in politics. You know where I'm from. So <laughs> I, I did some things I ain't proud of. So I'll be the first imperfect, imperfect, imperfect governor, mayor in the history of North Carolina, man. But. No, nah, it was it was really a cool thing. Uh she called two weeks ago and you know, I got I got some friends that like to act silly, so I thought they were playing games on the phone and <laughs> she was <laughs> she was like, Nah, it's, it's really me and she asked me to go out to lunch with her. Uh matter of fact dinner, I'm sorry. And then she said her people would arrange it and you know, on Saturday she said she would be in town and um we were able to arrange a nice dinner along with a couple of more guys and then she wanted to talk to me individually in a separate room, you know, just about some policies and some issues and you know, she was happy about the things I was doing in the community. And yeah. the cool thing was, um, we ate lunch two blocks away from my mural. So she said, I saw your mural. She said, I thought it was beautiful. She said I I wanted to take a picture with it, but you know, it's fourteen <laughs> It's 14 SUVs following us. Right? So I'm like, I only think the parking lot that big. So I was more in awe of the secret service that was around us. Right? I'm looking like it was a bunch of Kevin Costner's from the bodyguard. I'm like, man, these, these guys got a full-time job. Like, I'm, I'm more in awe of them than, than her. But it was a great moment, great moment. And I'm pretty cool to my daughter now. She didn't think I was cool before, but now my daughter thinks I'm cool. So it's cool with me. I get the sense that your daughter probably thinks you're cool. Anyway, uh, so I, I, I know just like following you on Twitter that uh, trash talk ensued. Is, is, is Kamala Harris, is she a good trash talker? Man, that's, she led with that. And I was like, good gracious. I, obviously, she an HBCU uh, Howard yep. alum. And so, you know, I, I don't want to repeat what she said, but <laughs> she said, Coach, lean your ear down here. And I was like, good gracious, you the VP. We we going at it like that. Okay. So that initially just broke the ice. <laughs> I was like, hey, that's... You know, like, you're an HBCU graduate, and then you're a VP right now. So it was crazy how she, she just led with the trash talk. And I just thought she humanized herself you know, instantly. And I just thought that was the coolest thing about it. Lavelle Moten is joining us here on the Adam Gold Show. Man, you just lived the greatest life in the world. Uh, <laughs> be- before we get to your team and the season, I mean, we're about to start this uh, next week. Um, I just want your thoughts on the, not really the timing, and uh, I'm not looking to be critical, but the the, the surprise retirement of Tony Bennett and mm-hmm, what it mm-hmm. says about, Coaches who have achieved so much mm-hmm. being so dismayed about the state of affairs of the game that he would walk yeah. away at this point. Yeah, it's it's so unfortunate, right? Because the one thing one of the things that makes our game and our sport so great is the coaches and the impact that they have on the lives of these young men and young women as well. Um I, I kind of saw it coming with Tony. You know, he was one of the great guys in the business. Um and I saw it coming with, with Roy. Uh, right. I saw it. I didn't see it coming with Jay, but, you know, there's some more coaches out there that I know of, and they're, they're expressing their disappointment. And I think what happens is, um, just like anything, when you sign up for, w- w- when you sign up for something and you're not, you're no longer involved in that, it kind of makes you question what are you in it for? Um, our game and our sport has been a beautiful sport. It's, it's, you know, I, and I'm speaking as an student athlete. It saved right. my life, right? It it was able to get me out of some challenging circumstances, and I was the first one in my college to go to. I'm the first one in my family to go to college. Excuse me. So it, it's done great things for me, and I'll always respect that and understand it. Um, I think one of the problems is we have too many casuals chiming in about the sport when they never played, never done it on this level or whatever. So they just think it's all about, well, these coaches quitting because they upset the kids are getting paid. No, that's not the case. I don't, right. I don't care if you get paid. Like <laughs> this is, this is America. I, I don't care. <laughs> right. 
I was a kid who had his jersey in the store, and people were selling my jersey, and they didn't have twenty dollars in my pocket. So again, I'm always pro student athlete. Right. I just think there's. I think our game has gotten out of control. There's no legislature. There's no rules. It's become the wild, wild west, right? And once it's the wild, wild west, and you're no longer, quote unquote, it's no longer amateur athleticism. It's no longer amateurism at all. You, these mm-hmm. kids are semi-pros, right? And so if we're going to treat them and pay them like pros, then we have to change the rules and regulations um, so they can abide as pros, right? Because nobody cares about an education. You ain't heard nothing about nobody graduating and, and education. Like, no, nobody cares about that anymore. Right. I haven't had a parent in 30 years call me about academics. It's always about playing time and money now, right? right? And so that has changed, and I just think it's kind of pushed um, coaches who initially signed up for one thing out of the business, and they say, hey, we can do better, right? And I think one of the other problems is we're, we're starting to, you know, people are saying, well, coaches can leave whenever they want. Why can't players leave when they want? And I, I just cringe when I hear that because there's always been a tier system in, in, in America, right? It's, it's adults and then there's kids, Right. And kids don't get to do what adults do. Right. When I was in high school, um, they had this thing called the teacher's lounge. Right. It was specifically <laughs> for teachers. Right. Right. As students, we couldn't go in there and eat in the teacher's lounge and say, well, teachers do it. Right. Um, my mom and her, her girlfriends, when they are together in a circle, they're the best of friends, but they call each other some names that I can't even repeat <laughs> on here. Right. <laughs> I'm a kid. I can't jump in that conversation and call them those names because right. I want to be like, you follow what I'm saying? So yeah. there's always been a fine line. And if we, if we're going to say that and go with that, then we also have to understand coaches have buyouts in their contracts. Right. So, right. And performance clauses and incentives. So if a kid is getting paid and he, he's not averaging 10 points, can his money be deducted? Right. And if he chooses to leave a school, then he should be required to pay some of that buyout back. Right. Those are the, like you can't be a, a student when you want to be, but not be a student when you got to be, right? And so the NCAA has to do a better job of regulating this thing and legislating this thing or else it's going to continue to spiral out of control, right? I, I think mm-hmm. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but um, a couple of years ago, I I offered a proposition, you know, to the NCAA, mm-hmm. and I, I just think it's, I just think it's really really fair right and everyone wins and it's not spiraling out of control um and that was you know i think the ncaa is an eight billion dollar non-profit organization right right <laughs> so let, let that process a little bit and i think they might make probably close to a billion dollars um off of the ncaa tournament yeah. right and so let's say it's 360 schools in division one um i would say take 500 million and do revenue shares, just chop it up that way. Obviously, the Power Fives, they get, let's say, 65% of it. Then the mid-major pluses can get uh, 20% of that revenue share, and the low majors can get 15% of that revenue share that goes back into their schools, and now the schools can pay the players right. evenly, and it can be distributed. Just like that, it's really that simple, right? So everybody's re- investing into a revenue share, of a nonprofit organization and the umbrella in which it all falls under. Right. And that nonprofit organization as a nonprofit is giving um, a percentage of those proceeds back to the labor workers, quote unquote, so to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. So now everybody's happy. And so you don't have to worry about who's paying this kid $120,000 and he's averaging two points. And now the kid is pissed when he gets to school because what they said was going to happen. Now he don't get his money. So now he want a red shirt and sit up like it's all over the place. And yep. then at the end of the day, what happens? Some of these kids jumping from school to school to school to school when their ed- eligibility is exhausted, they're 24, 30 hours short of graduation and no one is going to pay for their degree. And that's where I come in. at. That's what my concern is in this whole thing, because at the end of the day, it still takes what it takes to get to the NBA. I don't care how many schools you transfer <laughs> to. You better be damn good. Like yeah. that's, that's the reality. And so for the 99 percent that's not going to make it, I think we're doing a, doing them a disservice. But I think we're smart enough to come to a conclusion where everyone can win. 
And so we just ain't done that yet. And it's a, it's problematic and it's pushing great people out of the game. Yeah, it really is. I mean, Tony Bennett was talking about um, collective bargaining and I'm in favor of that. I think the, at some point the players, and I think it's, that's, it's what's going to happen anyway. They're going to be declared employees and there'll be right. collective bargaining. And there, it comes with a different set of, I'm not going to say problems, a different set of rules and regulations, uh, but it's essentially, it protects the schools. Because I think Tony's big problem, and it, this may be yours too, but you've probably had to deal with it, is building a roster and maintaining oh a roster. Yeah. And I think that's probably what has gotten Tony and maybe what got Roy Williams and, and some of these others uh, that have decided to leave the profession because uh, it is more and more difficult to maintain continuity. Virginia's success was built on familiarity with mm-hmm. who the roster was. That was what Villanova was doing. North Carolina's mm-hmm. success is still be, uh, built on that. They have been mm-hmm. fortunate to be able to have uh, a lot of continu- continuity with their roster. You've had to deal with this anyway. Um, yeah. What? Yeah. I mean, you've got two good players, and you know, two all 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 MEAC players coming back. Um, mm-hmm. But to me, that's the real issue: is how to build a roster. Right. It's 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 the it's the most, <laughs> it's, it's the craziest thing ever, right? Like, because at the end of the day, we're no longer coaches, we're general managers. Right. Um, with 13 free agents on our team each year. And you don't know if they're going to leave, when they're going to leave. All it takes is someone to da- dangle something shiny in front of them or give them a carrot and, you know, they're out the door. Um, they don't, a lot of these kids don't have the support system that teaches them all money ain't good money, right? Right. So we're not, Right. It's just like, OK, if you're getting 10,000 from this university and someone offer you 15,000, leave then go. Not knowing, man, 5,000. It sounds a lot. Right. And you and I both know, like after taxes and that's not going to last you forever. So right. every decision must be based off your personal development. And that's what I try to tell kids. Right. I had the opportunity and I always speak from a personal spot. I had the opportunity to leave North Carolina Central when I played three times and I didn't because I just thought my overall development was best at North Carolina Central. And I, one of those schools was an ACC school, right? But I stayed there and look what it did for me, right? So I, I, I stuck it out and I invested into my future. These kids aren't invest, investing in their futures anymore. They're just getting it right now. And I understand it because they're hungry right now. They don't have any money right now. A lot of these kids come from families of dysfunction and you know, non-generational wealth. And so I get it. I understand it. That's why it just needs to be legislated. And I understand it from both sides, but it's so difficult to build a roster. We always strived and thrived off, you know, taking a kid that nobody really wanted and developing that kid and so on and so forth. And we did that. And, you know, we, we, we had a kid two years ago that we were the only scholarship that offered the kid. And he came to us and got an all-conference selection and left us for seventy-five thousand dollars. Right, so it's no loyalty anymore. Right, it's no loyalty is just they don't even know what that word is. It's a it's a tattoo to them, right? And so it's <laughs> it's all over the place, man. It's uh, it's all over the place. And we're teaching these kids. I don't know. At the end of the day, what are we teaching these kids? Right, like the life lessons that are necessary components of being a man and being a husband and being a father. At like. You know, it's, it don't, it don't embody you to run from a circumstance or run to get better or like, nah, you got to stay there and work some things out. And if you don't have those components when you're 20, it's going to be extremely hard to have and develop those components of life when you're 30 and 40 years old. All right. Before we have to say goodbye, uh, we can get, we can get lost in the weeds and all these things. And I'd love to have, uh, you know, there's a, there's a much longer, broader and detailed conversation that we can have yeah. about the state of intercollegiate athletics and uh, what it uh, what it is supposed to represent and what it actually represents from both sides, from players and uh, and the schools, because the players are. I think this this is sort of the seesaw coming back up uh, to right. a uh, to a large extent. It's probably already all the way up. Uh, right. But y- your your team starts Monday. You're you're, yeah. you're on the road in Fairfax, Virginia, against George Mason. I know you've got two all. Uh, preseason all MEAC players, Poe Boy King and uh, Keyshawn Porter. Uh, these are two of your leaders. Uh, it, you know, give give me a scouting report on these two guys, uh, and then what uh, what do you expect out of this team? 
Man, I'm, I'm still getting to know. We've had two different scrimmages, and we're still toying with lineups overall because we have maybe six or seven new guys through the right. portal. And to be honest, I don't know them, right? They're good right. guys, but I don't know them as basketball players. And they're still trying to learn and embrace our system. And that, that's the frustration, frustrating component yeah. of all of this. It's like, good grace, it's like you got to get to know a bunch of these kids every single year. And it's just like, wow. Um, as far as Pope Boy and Keyshawn Porter, uh, we expect them to do great things. And, you know, I tell them preseason selections is just they're doing what they do off of potential, right? But potential is just a fancy word. That means you ain't done nothing just yet, right? <laughs> so um, they're going to uh, have to lead the way for us, obviously. But um, they also have to understand that it's not going to be easy for them because we had some players, Fred Cleveland, Jadarius Harris, um, who made life easier for them last year. Right. right. And so now as you move up on that bulletin board or on that scouting board, things get a little tougher. Things get a little more difficult. The same looks you got last year would not be as clean this year. You're not surprising anyone because now you're the primary focus of, of right. the scouting and the scouting department. And so they have to know, and understand the attention to detail that's required right now. So that's what we're working with them on. And, you know, I'm excited about it. I hope they have a great year, but um, we're just trying to piece this thing together. We look like scrambled eggs right now. <laughs> <laughs> we're just trying to piece this thing together, man. It's, it's hard. It's really difficult, you know, when, when you're constantly changing personnel, seven, eight new guys, because basketball is just such a game of chemistry and synergy. I don't care about your talent. Right. Like they got a jail, right? And they got to know each other, play together. And, you know, it's a lot of underlining and undertones that's um, connected to it, but we'll be fine. We'll there, be fine. There's also a responsibility that comes from being the uh, the focus uh, and also a responsibility that, you know, you you have to bear putting on the central jersey. You guys – you guys aren't. I mean, it's not you. You're not just a local program in Durham. People, <laughs> right. know, people know who you are. People know who you yeah. are personally, but they know they know the program now. Right, right. So you're not sneaking up, right? You know, the the the. We've had a lot of success. Um, I think, I think they said we've won. I think we went Division One in 2011 officially. Yep. And in that time, I think we won eight championships. You know, four regular season, four conference tournaments. So we've won eight championships in 13 years, right? And I think the other three or four years, we finished second, right? right. So it's like you're not sneaking up. The, our standard is our standard. Um, and uh -huh. our fan base is spoiled. Like everyone is spoiled, right? And so uh, that's exactly what we wanted the program to be um, when we initially took over. And so uh, we've just got to continue to maintain and sustain it. Yeah, the the did I just hear? Uh, the standard is the standard that yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. such a Mike Tomlinism that yeah, is fantastic. Right. It's, 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 <laughs> if anybody's out there listening, I must say this because I've seen this way too much as a hashtag in other people's programs stuff like that. Mike and I was talking about that years ago in the dorm room at uh in in Latrobe at training camp, and so. <laughs> We used it, and now everybody uses it. So everybody owes us some publishing. <laughs> That's <laughs> and right. Some uh, copyright. Yeah, yeah. So if you use that, the standard is the standard. You owe us some some copyright, and you can write that off the NCCU men's basketball if you listen to right there, because everybody and their mama is using that slogan right now. That is fantastic. All right, Coach uh, Lavelle Moat, NC Central. Good luck on Monday at Mason. I will talk to you very soon. You the best, man. Appreciate you, Adam. Are you dropping us? The standard is the standard. That got me. That hit me right there. Love him. I, I, hundred percent, hundred percent. Go, uh, go, Eagles.